Hello, uh, welcome back. In the previous lecture, uh, or previous two lectures, we were looking at uh, uh, applications of Pigeon Hole principle, right? And then uh, while we were doing this, we came across a, a small uh, application where we showed that uh, you know if you if you take uh, six or more uh, people, then you know among these people you can always find either three people who know each other, who has met each other, or three people who are strangers who has never met each other. Right? Now uh, this result uh, is you know is one of the uh, you know, one of the starting points in in a huge area in community what is called Ramsey theory. And uh, uh, there, there can be many, uh, many generalizations of this. And these generalizations uh, are kind of also related with the uh, you know, uh, pigeon hole principle in some sense. We will see that uh, uh, in a moment uh, and try to look at today's lecture with the uh, more general theorem of Ramsey. And then uh, we will see that, uh, you know, how it is a generalization of our pigeon hole principle okay so <clears throat> what what the theorem that we proved was saying that if you have a graph right we, we also looked at the graph version of the same if we have a graph and the graph uh, has six or more vertices right you take a six vertex graph for example and you color you know and, and you uh, you know you you put all possible edges right you consider the complete graph and then you color all the uh, all the uh, edges with just two colors, right? Then we were able to show that you will find an, either a, a red triangle or a blue triangle, right? A complete graph on three vertices with all edges having red color or blue color. It's mutual strangers or mutual friends. Now suppose instead of six, suppose we had only five, right? So we, we use the fact that, you know, uh, we had uh, six vertices at least to apply the pigeon hole principle. Now, you know, but that doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, smaller graphs, you cannot have uh, such a property. But let us let us now show that if you have only five vertices in the graph, then we need not have this property. Okay? So I'm going to give a five vertex graph. See, here is a five vertex complete graph. And I have given a two color ring, right, of the edges. So all the you know 10 edges are here and then you know this five edges five cycle i give uh, red color and then in the inside you know, i look at this five edges and then also give uh, blue color so this colors all the edges but the point is that you cannot find a triangle of the same color right you cannot find a single color triangle right if you take any of the blue edges you know, they never form a triangle, right? They form a five cycle, and outside also it forms a five cycle. So we needed at least six. Right? So uh, six is the smallest number with this property. Now, if you have anything larger, uh, you know we already saw that we always have the property because once you know six will do this, you can always take a subset with six and that has this property the entire set has this property so and and we use pigeon hole principle for the six case like this right you had at least three of the same color and then you know you look at the edges between those three neighbors and those neighbors you can see that whichever way you color is either creates a triangle of either red which is or or blue now so this talks about coloring the edges of a triangle with two colors. What if we allow more colors, right? See what what essentially the Ramsey theorem was saying. We said that you know when you know in in when you try to make things more chaotic, as far as the you know the set that we are considering is really huge, then you can still find some order within that, right? So uh, here is the uh, question. That suppose I increase more colors, then what can you say? Right? Suppose I say that I use instead of two colors, I use k colors. 
So if you if you take k colors and color the edges of a complete graph with k different colors, what is the smallest number of vertices which can guarantee there will be a, a complete graph of let's say you know either triangle or something larger like you know four vertex complete graph, five vertex complete graph, whatever, uh, where all the edges have the same color. Right? You can ask this. Now one question is that does there exist uh, such a small number right uh, such a such a not small such an integer such that after that you can always guarantee this now it turns out that there exists always so but this needs proof and uh, you know we are not going to prove it at this moment but i will i will let you think about it and maybe try to prove for uh, some special uh, cases so just uh, uh, just two colors uh, with a larger number of clicks Okay, so here is the general uh, question <laughs> or the theorem of Ramsey in a slightly more general form. You will find even more general form later. So let uh, C1 to CK uh, be K different colors and uh, N1 to NK be integers where NI at least 2. Okay. Then you can find some integer okay, R of N1 to NK. Okay, so n1 to nk are the numbers. So, you know, in the in the problem that we looked earlier, we were looking at we need a complete graph on three vertices, which is all blue, or three vertices which is all red. Right? Here you are saying that you have n1 vertices, n2 vertices, etc., nk vertices. Then you are asking for uh, a, either a complete graph on n1 vertices where all the edges have color c1, n2 vertices all the edges have color c2 or nk vertex a complete graph where all the edges have color ck okay so so the claim that the theorem says that then there exists an integer r of n1 to nk which let us say p uh, such that any edge coloring of the complete graph on this many vertices kp with the k colors c1 to ck must contain either a k n1 colored c1 or a k n2 colored c2 or a k n k colored c k this is something which you cannot avoid so as far as the number is large enough right as far as the number is larger than r of n1 to n k okay uh, yes so yeah i mean yeah so uh, Fine. Yeah. So so when when p is larger than r of n1 to nk or whatever something, then uh, you know you can always consider this uh, some subgraph and then that subgraph has this complete subgraph of same color inside. Then you know the entire graph has this as subgraph. So that is okay. So we don't have to worry about writing in a different way. Okay. So this is the general form of Ramsey theorem. Right. You have a k coloring of the edges of the complete graph. Uh, and then you are asking, can you find uh, smaller some complete graphs of certain orders where all the edges have the same color? Now, so in uh, using the same notation, what is R of M n? Right, R of M n says that you are looking for a complete graph. So you are looking at two coloring because there are only two arguments here, uh, and uh, you are looking at a complete graph uh, on M vertices as a subgraph with uh, the first color all the edges having the same color or a complete graph on n vertices where all the edges have the second color right so this is rmn okay now what we proved earlier was that using pj non principle r of 3 3 is equal to 6 okay if you have six or more vertices in the graph then you can always find a triangle right of the same color now what is r of 2 2 can you think of this and try to solve it very easy i think you can do it what about uh, r of 3 4 okay so r of 3 4 is equal to 9 now the question is that can you prove it can you come up with a proof that r of 3 4 is equal to 9 uh, again these things i don't know i mean you know maybe it's much more difficult to prove r of 3 5 r of 4 4 and r of 3 3 3 right this so you are three coloring now, right? 
then show that if you have 18 vertices or more then you will contain a uh, triangle of first color or second color or third color okay so the, these numbers we already know right for these small values now what about r of 5 5 okay so r 5 5 ask for a complete graph on five vertices as a right like something like this complete graph on five vertices but all the edges must have the same color so complete graph on five vertices where all the edges have the first color right red or a complete graph on five vertices where all the edges have the color blue right now what is the smallest such number with this property well we still don't know the exact value okay? what we know is that it is between 4 43 and 49 okay r55 is between 43 and 49 now what is r66 right you can ask now i want to tell you a story okay so this is this is a story uh, you know there is a this is a, uh, a story of uh, what paul erdos a very famous mathematician many of you might have already heard about him used to say okay so when when he talks about problems related to ramsey number he, he will say this following joke okay but half serious also, not not just a joke so the the joke is the following that so he says that see r55 he believes it is very difficult to compute okay? very difficult indeed to find exactly we still don't know as i told you we still don't know what is exact value but he says that uh, suppose suppose you know suppose some uh, alien forces right you know alien forces come like you know from some other galaxy they come here or some other you know star system from our galaxy but they are vastly more superior to us they have all kind of technology you know they can have it you know they have something like you know what you see in this kind of uh, sci-fi movies right you know you, you can just destroy a planet you know with some weapon so they are so powerful that they, they have such uh, weapons and they come here and then they you know uh, tell us that well we will uh, let you leave if you tell us the value of r55 okay then he says that maybe you know we can put all our forces together put all the computers to work for the same question you know do some parallel computation all the mathematicians work on their own you know, or, or work together to find out this value maybe uh, we can uh, save our planet right by finding the value and telling them the correct value but suppose they ask for r66 just kill them before they even think of attacking us because he says that it is not when I mean, at least he believes that it's not possible okay i mean not with the current knowledge and techniques and all we have at least it's what uh, uh, you know uh, he says so yeah so so finding you know ramsey numbers precisely is a very very difficult problem so people try to find uh, you know bounds like upper bound lower bound etc we will not go into any of those things not in this course uh, or maybe at the end we can try to try to prove some lower bounds or something or even upper bound maybe uh, using some some arguments okay now uh, you know some some new techniques that we will learn maybe now on the other hand we can find some you know some you know, not necessarily great looking but you know some kind of upper bound without much difficulty so for that uh, what i want to do is i want you to show that rmn exists okay well at least try okay so try to show that rmn exists by showing an upper bound for it See, what we are saying is that you know, if a number uh, is larger than rmn then of course uh, we can guarantee that there will be a m complete graph or an n complete graph of red color or blue color right but uh, when we say we find an upper bound right, we are saying that okay we don't know precise value of rmn but if you make sure that you know if the number is maybe much much larger than the actual value of rmn right you go it's much larger than let's say 
20,000 uh, m times n or something or like you know 20,000 whole power m times n or something like that right? whatever some number or m raised to 2 raised to m and 2 raised to n or something then uh, can you say at least in that case that uh, you know anything larger than that will contain a m complete so this this kind of some you know some weird much larger number uh, can be an upper bound saying that anything larger than, so therefore it says that it exists because you know we know that as far as you go above this you are guaranteed so it means that it exists definitely we don't know the, what is the smallest one but we know still such things exist so prove that rm and x is right rm and x is uh, by by showing some argument maybe induction or something that you know well anyway think about it and try it I am not giving it as homework, but it's not part of this work that we are looking at, but it will be instructive and interesting. Okay. So here is the question. Can you prove that Rm and X is? That is for every n m belongs to n plus, there is a positive integer Rm and such that a red blue coloring of the edges of complete graph on P vertices for P greater than or equal to Rm and must contain a copy of Km for all uh, whose edges uh, having blue color or a KN where all uh, edges are red color. So one of these must be present. Okay. Now, <clears throat> an even more generalized question that we can ask. Okay. So what's called Ramsey theorem for hypergraphs. So we, when we talked about graphs, what was what was a graph for us, right? The graph was basically a set. We had a set of vertices, right? And then some two elements of this, right? So we were, uh, you know, restricting ourselves to binary relations. Now suppose we, you know, instead of binary relations, we look at arbitrary relations, right? So we're talking about arbitrary subsets. Uh, then you have what is called uh, hypergraphs. Okay. So a hypergraph is basically a set together with a collection of subsets. Okay. So E is a, just a collection of subsets. We don't even say what uh, kind of uh, sets are there. So elements of S are called vertices and the sets are called hyperedges. So here is an example, right? You have this uh, five vertex, uh, no, four word, uh, yeah, five vertex uh, graph, hypergraph. And where now I have these edges, right? So these two elements of set is an edge these two elements of set is an edge then there's three elements of set is also an edge okay so this no so what if you give numbers like one two three etc to this like say this is one this is two this is three this is four this is five then our vertex set is the set one two five right then what are the edge sets so edge is basically uh, one two three is some edge 1 2 3 is an edge then 4 5 is an edge and then 3 4 is an edge so 1 2 3 4 5 and 3 4 so these are all edges of uh, this hypergraph right so this is an edge right 1 2 3 so in earlier we had only two elements of this but now we can have any kind of uh, you can even just have one right one element that is also allowed when you let's say that you have uh, uh, you have this right this is one so i can say that this is also an edge so this is okay now <coughs> yeah. yeah now uh you know when you have this kind of arbitrary uh subsets you know it's even more difficult to deal with. So we will we'll often look at a slightly more restricted version that we call uniform hypergraphs. So a K uniform hypergraph is basically a collection of K element subsets of us. So we only look at K for some fixed K. Like a, when it is two uniform hypergraph, it is just a graph. When it is a three uniform hypergraph, then you have all the edges have three vertices inside, right? All the edges have three vertices inside. So here is an edge, here is another edge, here is another edge, and then here is 
another edge. So, uh, yeah. And then when we have all possible three element subsets part of this edges, then it's called a complete T uniform hypergraph. So I denote it by KTN or KNT. Yeah. The complete T uniform hypergraph set of all T element subsets of an N element set. So this N says the the subscript says the number of vertices and the superscript says the cardinality of the edges, right? Not cardinality of the edge set for each edge. What is the? So here uh, we have given a three uniform hypergraph, not necessarily not a complete one. So now here is the general form of Ramsey theorem. So it again it says the existence of a positive integer r t now right because we are talking we are talking specifically about t uniform uh, hypergraphs r t of n1 to n k the smallest number such that a can any k coloring of the hyper edges right so now instead of coloring the edges we are coloring the hyper edges right all this you know this thing i will color with uh, uh, color let's say red this will color with blue this color with again red maybe this also red right something like that so any uh, k coloring of the hyper edges of k p t contains right k n i t of color c i for some i okay so k n 1 t of color c 1 k n 2 t of color c 2 etc k uh, n k uh, t of color c k one of these uh, yeah uh, for every p greater than or equal to rt of n1 to nk okay so this k coloring i will assume that the colors we have used are c1 to ck okay? so earlier we noted uh, noted it here we i am not writing it specifically we will assume that the k coloring means that Colors C1 to CK, just some index here. Okay, so that is the generalized form of Ramsey theorem. Okay. Now we want to see why this is a generalization of Bayesian Holt principle. Right? That is what we started with, right? We started by saying that we are going to look at Ramsey theorem and say that it is a generalization of Bayesian Holt principle. Now, how do you say that? Can you think about a way to see this? And relate it with the Bayesian Hull principle. So, if you want, think uh, for a few minutes by pausing the video and then uh, continue later. So, <clears throat> first observation is that suppose t is equal to one. So, when t is equal to one, what happens? Then we are looking at one uniform hypergraph, which means that we have just vertices, and every vertex, you know, you have an edge right by itself. Which means that there is nothing happening, you know, just the set itself, right? There's nothing else really there, right? We can say that which of them belongs to edges, but that's it. But if you're looking at complete graph, then of course, all of them are basically edges. So, I'm looking at one uniform graph, R1 of N1 to NK, say that I want N1 vertices of the color 1, N2 vertices of the color 2, or NK vertices of color K, right? But, but this is something that we already saw, right? What we saw was that, like, uh, if you were uh, uh, coloring, let us say, n1 plus n2 plus etc. plus nk minus k plus 1 vertices with uh, colors c1 to ck, then at least one of them, right, like, will have uh, this property that n1 with color 1 or n2 with color 2 or nk with color See, basically coloring and you know putting into boxes are the same thing, right? No, I let us say I just label the boxes, k boxes, k1, you know, uh, box one, box two, etc. with colors c1, c2, etc. C k. So when I put balls into uh, boxes one by one, that is by saying that okay, I'm coloring these balls or the, the set elements, right? Whatever it is, with colors. So I have a k coloring now, and then we are saying that okay. What we have by PHP is that if you have n1 plus n2 plus n k minus k plus 1 uh, total vertices in the graph, then or, or total elements in the set, 
and your uh, total balls uh, that you are going to put into k boxes then one of the boxes will contain at least n1 right or uh, of the same first color or n2 of the second color is n k of the last color so this was generalized form of psp right so we can see that even for just t is equal to 1 what we get is something uh, in the form of generalized form of p general principle so now we can see what happens you know in terms of t you know, it is not exactly in the same uh, statement but you know you can see that why it is a generalization right so so that is it so ramsey theorem is a generalization of p general principle okay so so we want to wind up this section uh, by stating something which doesn't look like we general principle but you know has some flavors of it so this is called averaging principle okay this is also a very useful tool we will not use it at this moment but we will see that it can be used to show some very amazing result by generalizing into what is called probabilistic method the same idea but you know slight improvisation so here is the averaging principle suppose i give you numbers let's say uh, i don't know which numbers i don't tell you right i tell you that i give you uh, that i have some collection of numbers i don't even tell you how many numbers but i tell you that the average of these numbers is something like uh, let's say uh, alpha or like 27 okay suppose i tell you that average of uh, you know set of numbers that i have is 27 what can you say uh, from this information that I give you, right? If I give you that the average is 27, then you know that there must be at least one number whose value is greater than or equal to 27. Because if every number is strictly less than 27, the average will be strictly less than 27. Right? Similarly, you also know that there is always some number whose value is less than or equal to 27 because if everything is strictly greater than 27 then also the average will be strictly greater than 27 right? without knowing anything about how many numbers are there what kind of numbers we have there anything we can still say this information from just the average so this is called the averaging principle okay so given that alpha belongs to real numbers are is the average of a given set of numbers we can conclude that the set contains some element x whose value is greater than or equal to alpha and some element y whose value is less than or equal to alpha of course they can all be equal to alpha that's okay now as i told you uh, this can lead to some powerful uh, techniques like probabilistic method now suppose i tell you that you know some i give you a little more information right I tell you that the average of a set of integers is 7.5, right? If average of a set of integers is 7.5, then you know that there is at least one number whose value is greater than or equal to 8 and one number whose value is less than or equal to 7, right? This is also something that you can say. Okay, so with that, uh, uh, you know, we, uh, you know, we, we finish this uh, part and then we continue to a, a different look at, uh, you know, the sets that we are looking at. So we are so far looking at like, you know, n plus one, uh, you know, at least n plus one guy is going to n boxes and things like that. Now we are saying that we have an infinitely many uh pgns coming in right okay so we have infinite flock of pgns that you know many 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 pgns are coming and now they want they have to sit in a finite number of cages finite number of pgn roots so suppose an infinite flock of pgns land on a finite number of pgn holes then some pgn hole must have infinite sub flock sitting inside right when if every one of the finite cages has finite many pgns then we know that there is only finitely many pgns sitting everywhere together right so therefore one of them must have infinite this is also obvious to us and but this is called infinite pgn principle 
now this can be used to prove some very amazing results okay for example you can use you now combinatorics right this kind of arguments to prove for example uh, you know uh, theorems from analysis so let us look at some some examples okay so if uh, uh, some of these concepts are little difficult for uh, non math students you know they can really uh, just browse through it and we don't without looking at past details but it will be still inter interesting and instructive uh, to see you know how this kind of a method can be applied but the, i think the first part definitely uh, is useful for everybody and then uh, i will end up with one question which will i will not prove here and i will ask uh, any math student uh, who may be looking at this course uh, to go through it and try to prove it themselves <coughs> so we start with a, a very famous theorem called bolzano weierstrass theorem so what does the bolzano weierstrass theorem say it says that every infinite bounded subset m of the real numbers r has at least one limit point in r okay every infinite bounded subset m of the real numbers has at least one limit point now maybe you know you are not math you will not know what is bounded and what is limit point they are very simple i am going to explain so a set is bounded if you can find some let us say a positive integer m okay some natural number m such that the absolute value of any element of the set m that we are looking at is strictly less than this uh, number that we consider okay so there is some natural number small m such that the absolute value of x is strictly less than m for every element x of m okay so whenever x is an element of m absolute value is strictly less than m so in some sense it is saying that you know uh, it is saying that uh, uh, let's say yeah. it is saying that you know you have like this uh, a real line then there is some number plus m and minus m right so the set m that we are considering is going to be sitting inside this interval right that is what we are saying that you know the elements of the set m infinite set what we are looking at is going to be all within within this range so that is what is boundedness okay that is always inside this minus m to plus m so the absolute value is strictly less than small m now the set m uh, you know contains uh, uh, not contains like the set m has a limit point let us say p in the real numbers r or p uh, some element p is a limit point of uh, m if for every epsilon greater than 0 the interval p minus epsilon and p plus epsilon contains infinitely many points of so like what we were looking and maybe i shouldn't have raised it so let's say that some point p we are looking at okay p0 minus m s m etc so this p is a limit point of the set m that we are looking at if uh, you now look at this interval okay where this length is alpha this length is also alpha right so p minus alpha this is p minus alpha and this is p plus alpha so this interval p minus alpha p plus alpha where alpha is any real number okay that interval contains infinitely many points of m right the number of points of m that belongs to this interval must be infinite in that case we say uh, p is a limit point now alpha can be made as small as you want right for every epsilon greater than 0 this is true so if i give you epsilon is 1 by 10 raised to 100000 then you should still be able to find infinitely many points of m inside so what the bolzano weierstrass theorem says is that if the infinite set is bounded then it has at least one limit point in r okay, you can always find some uh, element whose boundary contains infinitely many points for every uh, small enough uh, you know every, every not small enough every uh, interval right as, uh, any uh, as small as you want now 
So the proof of Bolzano-Weierstrass theorem by using infinite PGN principle. So what are the PGNs? Well, points of M are the PGNs. That is easy to see, right? Because I mean, easy to imagine, not see. Uh, because we know that for infinite PGN principle, we need infinitely many PGNs. And uh, right, infinite block of PGNs we want. And then, uh, yeah. And then uh, uh, we need to find some PGN holes, of course, which are finitely many in number, right? Finite number of PGN holes. But since we already have this infinite set M, points of M are the PGNs. Now, what are the PGN holes? Okay. So the PGN holes, we are going to define the PGN holes as the intervals. Because what we really wanted to show that uh, that there is a limit point says that some interval contains infinitely many points, right? So basically the PGN hole principle. When we apply, is going to tell us, you know, some interval contains infinite many points, and uh, that is what we precisely want, right? For any epsilon, we need this, but this is what we want. So therefore, we look at the interval. So you look at the uh, use the fact that the set M is bounded. So therefore, we can find this minus M and uh, plus M such that uh, the values of uh, or the points of M are strictly between the Interval is minus M and M, right? So every element are now going to be present inside this interval, right? Now, minus M to M, there are finitely many intervals, right? Minus M, minus M plus 1, minus M plus 1 to minus M plus 2, etc. Minus 1, 0, 0 to 1, etc. M minus 1 to M. So there is at most 2M intervals here. And you take the 2M intervals, then we know that uh, because they are finite, by pigeon hole principle, there must be some uh, interval which contains infinitely many points of M. Okay. So let us consider some interval, let's say 4, 5 contains infinitely many. There could be several, of course, several intervals contains infinitely many. If there are more than one, you pick one of them arbitrarily. Okay. So we found out 4, 5 contains infinitely many, let's say. So then what we do? Then uh, from this we selected for 5 it contains infinitely many okay so now what i am going to say is that my number is going to be uh, the the limit point that i am going to define is going to be 4 point something okay then what i do is that because 4 5 contains infinitely many i take the interval 4 5 and then divide it into 10 sub intervals like 4.1 4 4.2 etc 4.9 and 5 so take this 10 sub intervals again since there are infinitely many in this interval, we can we know that you know there are infinitely many here and there are only 10 finitely many PGN holes. So therefore, some interval must contain again infinitely many points. Whichever interval, maybe more than one, you select one of them at random. Then this interval definitely contains infinitely many points. So I'll say that now the limit point is going to start with x equal to 4.2. Then take 2, 3, again subdivide. I will get something maybe the 7, 8 interval. So I will select 7. Then uh, I will take the 7, 8 interval and say that, okay, 1, 2 will have this. So I will take the next digit as 1. Then in 1, 2 will contain, you know, 1.89 might contain infinitely many. So I will take this. So this way I keep on doing. I can apply it as many times as 1 like depending on the accuracy, right? Whatever epsilon you give, I do it as many times. And then I'll show that I can continue to this. So this is, defines a real number, right? Maybe it doesn't stop, but still it defines a real number. And, uh, you know, by the decimal expansion. And then uh, the number is a limit point. So we can uh, easily show that x is a limit point of m. So I want you to think about y and show it yourself. Why precisely you can say that m is a, uh, the x that we have defined now is a limit point of m. Okay, so this is the Bolzano Weierstrass theorem. Now, as a homework, I want you to do the following theorem. This is a generalization of Bolzano Weierstrass theorem into no, it this Bolzano Weierstrass is on the real line. Now, let us take the real plane, right? You have x axis and y axis. 
So any bounded infinite subset M of R2 has at least one limit point in R2. Okay? So you can find some uh, some point in R2 with this property. Okay. Now what is the limit point in, in R2? So in, uh, earlier we said that the interval, you know, P minus epsilon, P plus epsilon. Now here you cannot say that, but we will say that, okay, take the point P and then uh, you look at, uh, look at uh, an in you know a, a disk around it okay this and with ra radius epsilon okay so the epsilon disk around this i take and then say that this contains infinite limit points uh, of m for every epsilon greater than zero you, you make it even smaller right smaller and smaller doesn't matter you will still find infinite limit so this way you can define uh, what is called a plane set theorem this is again the generalization of Bolzano which has to uh, dimension 2. So this is a homework for you. Now I want to finish up this uh, topic on uh, topic on uh, region hole principle with a very very interesting application. Okay? This is a very beautiful application uh, of some result that all of us have uh, known from the school time itself, but we never, most of us have never seen the proof of it. And uh, you know, this is uh, this well known result of uh, that you know, we have seen that, like, you know, if you take all uh, closed curves, right, like you know, like triangles or uh, uh, squares or hexagons, polygons, or you know, all kind of shapes with a fixed perimeter, you know, the length of the boundary is the same. Then, out of which some particular figure has the largest area. And we know that from the school time, we know that it is a circle, right? Circle maximizes the area. And this is called the isoperimetric problem. So isoperimetric problem says that among all closed figures of fixed perimeter P, the circle has the maximum area or we call circle is the extremal figure. Okay. Now, <clears throat> we all know this, right? But uh, how do we prove this? So there has been, uh, you, know, uh, you know, this result has been known for from thousands of years. In fact, they know the, they say that the Greek people used to know this theorem, isoperimetric problem. And then, uh, you know, uh, everybody in this, uh, you know, like uh, last 2000 years, you know, like how probably heard about this, but how many proofs were there? Very few. In fact, uh, proof uh, attempts were uh, also like probably few. And one of the uh, persons who tried to prove it was uh, Jacob Steiner. Okay, so Jacob Steiner came up with a proof. And uh, uh, we are going to see this proof, but the proof had a small gap in it. Okay? In fact, it's a big gap. But, okay, let us say a small gap. Uh, and that gap, uh, you know, was uh, pointed out by a German mathematician. Uh, I think I forgot his name. Sorry, I will. I will try to look it up later. And then he pointed it out. Uh, and then there had some argument. You know, one guy. You know. Uh, Steiner said that okay, that is not really required, right? You know, but then finally, like you know, that person convinced him that it is required. But we will first look at the Steiner's beautiful argument, which doesn't need any of the things that we looked at now. You know, something you can do from school time itself, like or almost, uh, you know, something like that. Maybe a little bit of calculus in it, but uh, you can still do it. Uh, and then we are going to uh, see uh, why that proof is not really complete and then how do you complete it. And for that you can use p general principle again. So the isoperimetric problem. So what is the uh, Steiner's proof? Okay, so I, I, I'm going to give only hints about this. I, I'm not going to really uh, do the entire proof. Uh, I want you to write down the proof. So what is uh, Steiner's argument is following? Suppose 
you have you know like you are talking about this extremal figures suppose f is an extremal figure now if f is extremal then f is a convex figure so what is a convex figure so a figure is convex if uh, you know if i take any two points uh, any two points whichever two points you take right then you take the straight line line segment joining these two the entire line must lie within that end and the set right so the set is convex or the figure is convex if any two points that we take you know the line segment joining them must lie within entirely uh, that set on the other hand uh, you know our polygons that we look at like this you know they are convex right because you take any two points no matter which two you take the line joining is within that on the other hand a figure like this is not convex right because i can take this point and this point right the line segment joining that is not inside the set it's outside so this is not convex this is convex so the claim is that if you are talking about extremal figures it must be convex can you think of why okay i want you to stop and think about it now uh, suppose it is not convex right we are talking about figures with the same perimeter you know the length of the boundary is the same right now if the figure is not convex i want you to show that you can uh, you can basically uh, you can basically increase the area without increasing the boundary okay so show that if the figure is not convex you can increase the area without increasing the length of the boundary so once you show that the claim one holds right if f is extremal then f must be convex now now you take uh, you know take this boundary you now the boundary uh, you know you pick one point right now in the boundary what you do is that you take uh, you pick one point and then uh, uh, what you do is that you you go along one uh, direction right and go exactly halfway through the perimeter you know perimeter is exactly half that you can do right you just move along one side till you reach exactly half and once you reach exactly half uh what you do is that uh, you you select uh, uh your second point okay so this point so let's say is a and b i say that this ab the line the, the you take a line connecting this ab okay this i call a cross cut now <clears throat> uh once you you know once you divide the perimeter into exactly two halves the claim is that uh, uh you know the areas must be equal also right so if you take such a cross cut this is called a cross cut then uh, uh, you know the area of this half and the area of this half they are all they are both equal so every cross cut divides the area into two equal parts okay now to basically uh, you know is strictly speaking to say that like you know you can always divide the perimeter into exactly two you you need a result you know from calculus that we study known as intermediate value theorem okay we will not uh, we will not uh, go into details there so intermediate value theorem says that if you if you i don't know whether i have written it here for you or i can just tell you uh, if you talk about uh, uh maybe i have written somewhere yes uh, we will come we will come to that okay don't worry uh we will need some result yeah so so every cross cut divides the area into two equal parts okay so that is the claim two so try to prove this claim two uh again using the fact that if that is not the case you can still 
without increasing the boundary you can still increase the area now claim 3 this is the most important claim for a cross cut let's say ab right so ab basically divides the perimeter into exact half so i can just take half of it right because you know the other half has the same thing and same area also so i just take one half then now we take any third point let's say uh, c on the boundary okay so you have a b cross cut a and b are on the boundary then you take the point c now the angle a c b is exactly 90 degree for any point c okay you take the point c here then this line segment right will also 90 you take this this will be 90 you take this this will be 90 right if you take this this must be 90 now why is this true can you prove that it must be 90 degree I want you to think about this, uh, but uh, let me give you uh, some idea, okay? But oh, yeah, you think about it sometime and then you listen to my idea, then you try to finish the proof. So here is the idea. Suppose, uh, suppose not, right? So we have some uh, angle is, let us say, uh, so this is, let us say, AC, then you have CB, right? right so this is a b so what i do is that i take this part a c so a c b so i have this a c line segment and uh, the c b line segment at this point c on the boundary i'm going to put a put a hinge okay i'm going to put a nail there then i will assume that you know this entire you know thing that we are looking at is made of like some thin paper uh, and then you have cut this part right and put this nail there so i have cut you now i have cut uh, this part out and this part out so i have this uh, you know uh, things right so these two things are there then what i do then uh, i will because there is this hinge i am going to take this piece of paper and i am going to rotate it i am going to rotate it in this angle or this angle now what happens when i rotate this well this area that we are looking at right this area is not going to change because i'm just taking this entire sheet right of paper the cut out part then moving it around right so this area does not change this area does not change and what happens to the boundary of the figure well the boundary also doesn't change right because in the boundary uh, this length and this length is the same, right? I am not changing anything there. So even if I rotate it like this, the boundary still remains the same length. Now, one, once I do this, what happens? Once I do this, all that changes is the triangle in between, right? This A, B and C. This triangle changes because the angle between these two line segments changes. Of course, the length of this and this doesn't change right so this length and this length doesn't change but the angle changes right when i rotate now suppose the angle between these two is theta and the length of this is let's say x and this is y so we know that the uh, the the area of the triangle is determined by the length of this side this side and the angle between those two sides right which is theta sine of the angle between these two sides right so you have x y sine theta and then half of that that will give you the area of the triangle now this area is maximized when theta is equal to 90 because sine theta is maximized when theta is equal to 90 okay so if the the angle must be equal to 90 for the, that area to be maximized. Now this tells that you know, if it is not 90, you can still maximize the entire area of the part that we are looking right? So using that, one can complete this claim, right? For cross cut AB and any other boundary point, 
the angle must be acb for every point on the boundary so this is the claim 3 now what does this show this shows that nothing apart from circle can be an extremal figure okay so this for this part i am using something which we have not really proved at this time that like if you look at the the locus of the points right or the or the you know the the only figure where uh, you know which makes uh, uh, you know angle uh, 90 on every point with this with respect to this cross cut right on the on the boundary is uh, going to be the circle or or you know the, the figure is disc and you know the boundary is a circle or semi circle now that result is something one can show without much difficulty but it's not uh, not uh, necessary for our current argument so let us uh, take it for granted that uh, such figures is the circle so what this says is that nothing apart from circle can be an extremal figure now the the problem right so see once you look at this you might think that okay the proof is already done right we have shown that you know you take the circle you know uh, circle is better than everything else so right that is the extremal figure or at least it looks like but the but the fact is that it it's not as simple as that okay uh, it will be kind of difficult to convince of this but uh, uh, let us look at some 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 weird analogy okay like uh, uh, Suppose, suppose I, you know, suppose I ask you uh, the following question, right? Uh, that uh, that if you if you take, let us say, uh, if you take a, uh, uh, if you take a needle, okay? Let me let me take a, a blank paper somewhere. Yeah. Suppose I take a needle. So a needle is basically a line segment without any without any width, right? Just a line segment of let's say unit length, whatever it is, right? Some unit, five centimeter, ten centimeter, one meter, one kilometer, doesn't matter. Some unit, one unit, line segment. What I want to do is that I want to place this line segment, uh, or in fact, I want to rotate this line segment. Uh, in the plane right so you know we are sitting inside this plane and i want to rotate the line segment 360 degree now what is the smallest area in which you can do this right what is the smallest area in the plane right so you want to find a set in the plane in, in this set i want to place this uh, line segment and rotate it I want to rotate the line segment in the plane. So by rotating, I mean that I want to start from this initial position. I want to slowly change it. You know, I can, you know, I am allowed to move it like, you know, left or right. If you want, you know, I can just can shift it here, shift it here, right? So I shift it here a little bit and rotate it a little bit. Then I shift it again back and then rotate a little bit. That is okay. Right? Whichever way you want, you can. But, you know, I want to slowly move this so that it covers every possible directions right so you know the infinitely many directions you know uh, in this uh, uh, 360 degree uh, this guy should be going through all those directions before it reaches back so the 360 degree rotation must happen now what is the smallest area of a figure in which you can do this of course the obvious way is that you know you put a uh, you know like uh, needle here right and then rotate in this big circle right you can always do it 360 degree you can rotate and uh, what is the area that you require for this that is 2 pi r right i mean no, uh, well, pi r square right pi r square is the area of the circle where uh, r is the you know it is unit so it is basically pi right so within pi uh, area whatever pi uh, you know unit square you can do this 
Now, uh, well, of course, you can improve it further, you know, drastically. Instead of selecting this point, I select the midpoint, right? I can just rotate it here. You know, it's, this is the center. So then the radius divide, you know, divides by half, so it will be pi by 4. Okay, I mean, I should write pi by 4. Instead of pi, we started with big beginning. I can reduce it to pi by 4, right? If you are really smart, okay, you can do, a, a, you know, even more different way. You can make it pi by 8. Oh, can you think about how to do this? Pi by 8. It's an interesting exercise, okay? Uh, now, but apart from that, now the question is that can you even reduce it further? So what is the minimum area in which you can do this? So people, you know, used to believe pi by 8 is the best possible and, you know, and uh, many proofs were there, you know, many attempts were there to try to reduce it. Until one day, uh, a person called Besikovic, he came and uh, proved that there is no smallest area. What do I mean by there is no smallest area? When I say there is no smallest area, what I mean is that you give me an area, right? Like, you know, I will say that 0 0.000001 unit square. I can give you a figure in which you can rotate this. You give me an even smaller area, 0 0.000000000001. Or like 1 raised to, and 1 into 10 raised to minus 20,000. Right? No matter how small you give me, and no matter how large your your unit is going to be, like you know, this can be one light square, uh, light light year length, or one hundred kilometer in length. As far as you give me, uh, you know, a line segment of that length, I can give you a set in which you can do this rotation. So which means that you can make the area go to as close to zero as you want. It, you can of course never reach zero, right? You cannot do rotation in a zero area. Uh, this thing. So therefore, it is never zero, but it can be as close to zero as you want. So which means that there is no minimum uh, area in which you can do this. So similarly, one question that one should really answer is that is there actually an extremal figure? Right? We said that nothing other than you know, nothing other than a circle can be extremal. But is there an extremal figure? If there is an extremal figure, we prove that, assuming that there is an extremal figure, right? This is all assuming there is an extremal figure, right? These arguments are assuming that, okay, suppose there is an extremal figure. If f is extremal, then f is convex, right? We assume that there is an extremal figure. Right? We said that if f is extremal, cross cut divides into equal parts. But maybe there is no extremal figure, right? Maybe these properties are there for circle, but still, that only says that, you know, all these properties must be there, right? But what is the guarantee that there is an extremal figure? Maybe there is no extremal figure, right? There is no largest area. You know, you can keep on, like, you know, <laughs> doing like this, right? Keep on making it small like that. You can keep on making it larger or something. We don't know. So, we need to prove that. And proving that requires another version of bolzano vesha theorem. So this is called bolzano vesha theorem for compact figures. I think I made the wrong choice. Yeah. So uh, for compact figures, uh, or BWCF, we say that any bounded sequence of compact figures has a converging subsequence. Okay? So this is for math students. Other students need not really look into this. But just to thinking about it may be interesting. But other than that. Uh, but my students uh, can look at this, should look at this. So any bounded sequence of compact figures has a converging subsequence. So what is a compact figure? So we already said what is, uh, what is bounded, right? Now if you have a set which is bounded, and we said what is a limit point. So if all the limit point of a set belongs to that set itself, then it is called closed. Now, if you have a set which is also which is bounded as well as closed, then it's compact. Okay. Now, if you have uh, 
as at s uh, and uh, i mean uh, not uh, as at s is a real number which is the exact upper bound of areas of all figures with perimeter p okay suppose so uh, okay sorry I, I i didn't mention this so suppose we proved bolzano vesha's theorem right any bounded sequence of compact figures has a converging subsequence once you have this property we can assume there is some uh, figure which is the exact upper bound of areas of all figures with perimeter p this is by using a property of real numbers existence of exact upper bound i will mention what is exact upper bound and how to prove this uh, in fact you can prove it using again pgn whole principle if you want uh but uh, yeah assuming that this is done already that we can we can say that uh, uh, sb the exact upper bound then for every natural number k we can find a figure mk with perimeter p and area greater than s minus 1 by k because s is exact upper bound in the neighborhood it should contain at least one point okay that's by the definition uh and so therefore if the exact upper bound of all figures of perimeter p uh, the uh, s is the area then s minus 1 by k for any k you should be able to find some figure which is close to that that is a property of exact upper bound now because the area is bounded and the perimeter is bounded right is fixed these figures will form a bounded sequence of compact figures and therefore you can apply the Uh, bolzano vesha theorem so therefore it has a limit point now if it has a limit point the the areas basically are keep on increasing to s and s is you know you know this this sequence of areas are converging to s so if there is a limit point for this that only possibility is s only you no know, you cannot have a different uh, value as the area uh, limit point of the areas Okay, so these things one can, you know, math students can easily uh, figure out. Therefore, by the above theorem, if we have the above theorem, this is a limiting figure. So clearly, the figure must have area S. So therefore, uh, by Bolzano-Vesha's theorem for compact figures, we can show that there is a limiting figure. And since we already know that the only possible limiting figure is circle, circle is the limiting figure, and therefore we have a maximum there and therefore we have circle obtains the maximum area now i want you to prove bolzano vesha theorem for compact figures is a result in analysis of course using the pgn hole principle infinite form so this is for just for math students other students are welcome to try if you want you know adventure students but you need some concepts which uh, mostly only math students see so here are the concepts needed to prove the uh, pgn hole uh, using the pgn hole principle to prove this okay so one one is that uh, a set m subset of r is bounded non empty then alpha belongs to r is an exact upper bound of m if uh, first property there is no larger uh, element in m right so x belongs to m x is greater than alpha there is no such x so alpha is an upper bound basically for all the elements so alpha is on the right hand side right then the interval alpha minus epsilon comma alpha contains at least one limit point of f for every alpha i mean for every epsilon okay so uh, for every epsilon uh, the interval alpha minus epsilon comma alpha contains at least one limit point of f. Uh, at least one point of sorry not limit point. okay so there are you know as close as you want to go there should be one point again and again and again and again right now i'm saying that it is at least one point of m because you know this point of m may be may be disconnected and sitting outside as a single point on the right hand point right that is still a uh, a point with this property right it's an exact upper point and uh, uh you don't need infinitely many points for it to be an exact upper bound okay but still you can show the existence of uh, an exact upper bound uh, using the uh, infinite php if you want then 
second condition if a continuous function so again i'm not going to define a continuous function formally here my students already know that other students can assume that it is a it's a you know smooth growing function in the sense that you know there are no breaks right in the values right so basically like you know if you start from a value it keeps on smoothly increasing till reaches uh, another value so if a continuous function over a connected set m attains uh, uh, let's say two values f of a and f of b where f of a is strictly less than f of b at uh, corresponding points a and b and f of a and f of b contain some number y in between then for any number uh, let us say y uh, you take in between then uh, you know uh, f of c is equal to y for some point c between the points a and b this is called the intermediate value theorem right? basically it says something like this so you have this uh, just, uh, colored pen. Yeah, so you have this, uh, let's say, I'll take the blue. So you have, let's say, these two you know, axes, and then you have this continuous function, let's say. And then it attains some values, let's say, uh, f of a and uh, some value f of b. Now you take any number between f of a and f of b, right? Let's say y. Then there is some point c between this a and b such that f of c is equal to y right this is kind of obvious once you see it in a visual manner but you need to prove it rigorously this is called intermediate value theorem okay something one can show easily and this is a result that you might require if you want to formally prove this uh, then uh, given a compact figure f the epsilon extension of f is obtained as the union of epsilon disks of all points of f okay so here is uh, an example so i take uh, i take let's say some you know compact figure then what i do is that you know, fixing some epsilon i will say that okay i take an epsilon circle right epsilon disk not circle right epsilon disk around each point of the set every point i'm going to keep an epsilon disk right then this right this uh, union of this epsilon disk gives me another set okay. this is called the epsilon extension of let's say the figure f uh, the figure f okay so we have the epsilon extension of the figure f now once you have epsilon extension i can define the distance between two figures like right? you know what is the distance between two figures like right? you can okay? so the distance uh, is defined as follows you take the epsilon extension of f and suppose you have another figure let's say g right another compact figure g and the distance between f and g is you take the epsilon extension of f and define the smallest epsilon such that you can put g inside f okay but you want your epsilon to be such that if you take epsilon extension of g you should be able to put f also inside g and the extension so the smallest epsilon says that epsilon extension of f1 contains f2 and f2 epsilon extension of f2 contains f1 that is called the distance between the compact figures f1 and f2 okay so this is uh, uh, these are the uh, you know these are the uh, points or uh, notions that you might require to really uh, formally prove the bolzano weierstrass theorem for compact figures and again using the infinite pgn for principle okay so try to prove this and then that will tell you you know uh, there is an 
you know extremal figure for the isoperimetric problem then we will prove that uh, circle has a maximum area among all these figures so i think uh, that would be a very nice question because you know it's a very classic question that uh, all of us have studied in school and uh, probably not seen a proof of it before so try to look at this and try to prove this so i think we we finish all the topics that we wanted to cover in pgn whole principle and then uh, you know there are many 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 questions that you should solve right in the textbook uh, that you have the provaldis book and uh, using this uh, uh, you now you will get more experience in solving okay so with that uh, uh, we stop for uh, today and then we will continue in the next class